Almost 3,000 people were shot in the city of Chicago last year. Men, women, small children, sometimes alone, sometimes in groups. Many hundreds of them died. Not a single one of those people received anything like the attention the media have lavished on a relatively minor assault alleged by the television actor Jesse Smollett. On the other hand, none of Chicago's 3,000 shootings was even half as useful as Smollett's story. His story had everything. The national media long ago gave up the pretense of gathering news. Journalism is now explicitly a political job. The point of it is to enforce cultural orthodoxies and punish enemies. Jesse Smollett was the perfect vehicle for both of those things. Journalists pretended to be horrified as they recounted what he said happened to him, but secretly, they were thrilled. There are many indications of a hate crime here. They are looking for two suspects who were apparently wearing Make America Great Again hats, though that has not yet been officially confirmed. We don't know what happened to Jesse, but what we do know is that uh, racism is alive and well in this country. There is real evidence of people who have done these crimes who cite that the president has, has, has inspired them. Um, the fact that um, they reportedly said this is MAGA country adds to sort of the, the atmosphere of menace that African Americans in particular particular, and people of color in general have felt um, since the, the advent of the Trump administration. And the media has really cast so much doubt on his story, which I find so personally offensive that a gay black man is targeted and then suddenly he becomes the victim of yeah. people's disbelief. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's so outrageous to me. He said his attackers hurled racial and homophobic slurs at him. Mm. This is America in 2019. This is America in 2019. To the national media, Smollett's story was the perfect metaphor for the Trump era. It was also, pretty clearly, a total crock. Smollett's account began to fall apart within hours. After a series of leaks from the obviously skeptical Chicago Police Department, Smollett's handlers paired him with a network anchor they could rely on to launder the hoax. In the end, Smollett sat for 16 and a half minutes with Robin Roberts of Good Morning America. Roberts surely knew there was ample evidence that Smollett was lying, but she decided to ignore that. Instead, Roberts colluded with him. She nodded empathetically as Smollett wept on camera. She asked no significant follow-up questions. The two parted like old friends. Both Smollett and Roberts turned out to be talented actors. Check out their performance on YouTube before it's scrubbed. You'll never watch ABC News again. Virtually every word they utter is dishonest. Smollett began by explaining that the men who attacked him were not muggers. They didn't want money. They assaulted him purely because his, of his identity as a gay black Democrat. People like Jesse Smollett aren't allowed to live in Donald Trump's America. That was the message of the attackers. This is MAGA country, they screamed. They were referring, of course, to Chicago, a city where 88 percent of the population voted against Donald Trump. As a crime story, it didn't make a lot of sense. And when skeptics on the Internet raised basic questions about his story, Smollett attacked them as racist. If I had said it was a Muslim or a Mexican or someone black, I feel like the doubters would have supported me a lot much more, a lot more. And that says a lot about the place that we are in our country right now. The fact that we have these fear mongrels, these people that are trying to separate us, and it's just not okay. What you just heard is a near perfect inversion of the truth, as Smollett himself might have put it. Who exactly is the fear mongrel here? Who is dividing us? And who exactly is the victim in all of this? Well, Smollett claims that he's the victim. He tells us that he represents the most despised and unfashionable groups in America. That's why bigots doubt his story. The rest of us nod as if this were true, because we're required to do that. That's how dishonest our society has become. Everyone must lie all the time. We know the rules. We have no choice. Meanwhile, our leaders immediately jump to the defense of this supposedly unpopular person before even hearing the evidence. Within hours, at least two presidential candidates had described what happened to Smollett as a, quote, attempted lynching. They assumed on faith that he must be telling the truth. By definition, they smeared anyone who doubted him. They called him a hero. Is this the treatment that marginalized people receive? No, hardly. 
Smollett isn't powerless, far from it. His power lies in pretending that he has no power. In fact, Jesse Smollett and his promoters are the aggressors in this story. They launched a calculated campaign of slander against an entire group of people who have far less wealth and far less cultural influence than they have. If there's a bias crime here, they committed it. Will anyone be held accountable for this? Don't bet on it. In 1987, Al Sharpton introduced the media to a young woman called Tawana Brawley. Brawley had an awful story to tell. She said she'd been viciously raped by a group of racist white men and left in a garbage bag. She was covered in feces with racial slurs scrawled on her body. The Brawley case dominated headlines across the country for more than a year, and it bitterly divided New York City along ethnic lines. People hated each other because of what Tawana Brawley said happened to her. But it was all a lie. After conducting hundreds of interviews, a grand jury declared the entire story fraudulent. None of it actually happened. Brawley fled the state. A judge ordered Al Sharpton to pay for damages for accusing innocent men of rape. That should have been the end of Al Sharpton's career. Yet, just the opposite happened. Before he promoted Tawana Brawley's lie, Sharpton was best known as a small-time hustler, an FBI informant from Brooklyn, a man who'd once been James Brown's road manager. After he perpetuated the single most destructive racial hoax in memory, Al Sharpton got a promotion. He became a world-famous civil rights leader. He ran for president. He became a policy advisor to Barack Obama. According to visitor logs, Al Sharpton was invited to the Obama White House more than 80 times. He got his own show on MSNBC, which he still has. Sharpton has never apologized or even acknowledged the harm he did to this country by lying about Tawana Brawley. No one has forced him to. The lesson of Al Sharpton was clear to everyone watching. There are no penalties for hate hoaxes. There are only rewards. Not surprisingly, there have been many more since. The incident escalated dramatically after the 2016 election. The Muslim student in Louisiana who claimed she was assaulted by racists and Trump hats. The Muslim woman in San Diego who alleged the same. An anti-Asian attack in Minnesota, an anti-gay attack in California, a racial attack in Delaware, racist graffiti at the Air Force Academy, anti-Semitic threats phoned into Jewish community centers. All fake. Those and many, many more. The much-hyped epidemic of hate crimes you've heard so much about essentially is made up. The premise is absurd. America is not a hateful country. It's the most welcoming place on earth. That's why, even as our children learn from their teachers what a bigoted country this is, millions continue to stream in from Africa and Latin America for a better life here. It's why we've welcomed more refugees and immigrants than any nation in history. It's why we rescued a young Ilhan Omar from a refugee camp in Kenya. We are kind people. You see it in your own life. How many violent racists do you know personally? None, probably. That's because there aren't many in America. The left has to invent them. Stoking race hatred ensures continued power for the Democratic Party. Divided populations are easier to manipulate and rule. There would be no Democratic coalition without racial animosity. It's what holds their constituencies together. That's the point of identity politics. It's why they're forever reopening the wound. It's why Al Sharpton is still a revered figure among Democratic office holders. But to the cost to the country has been high. Ask the kids from Covington Catholic. For the crime of having unfashionable political beliefs and skin color, a group of entirely innocent high school students came close to having their lives destroyed. That didn't happen by accident. The national media did it. They concocted a hate crime out of nothing. The Twitter mob then demanded that those boys be expelled from school and marked for life. Their parents were threatened. Their classmates were harassed. After two days, video surfaced proving that none of it was real. The mob moved on. But what if exculpatory video had not emerged? CNN panels would still be screaming for their blood. You sometimes hear people wonder why the media never seemed to learn anything from moments like these, moments when they're exposed as corrupt and reckless. And so the answer to that question is very simple. It never occurs to them that they may be wrong or that they might have something to learn. The media see themselves as teachers, not as students. If you ever tried to put a sleepy four-year-old into a snowsuit before school, you know how journalists feel about the audience. It's frustrating when children don't understand or obey, but you've got to keep trying. That's how they feel. Listen as that oily media reporter kid from CNN explains that the Jesse Smollett hoax does not in any way reflect poorly on the people who promoted it.
And perhaps the questioning was not tough enough on Good Morning America. But ultimately, this is not about the media or about politicians or activists or any of the people that might have been fooled. It's about Jussie. Oh, yeah. It's about Jussie. It definitely has nothing to do with any of us in the media who uncritically repeated his lies night after night for political effect. It's Jussie's problem now. That's Nancy Pelosi's new position, too, by the way. Almost immediately after a Smollett story hit the news wires, the Speaker of the House denounced the racist and homophobic attack. Quote, may we all commit to ending this hate once and for all. Pelosi has since deleted that tweet. She has not apologized for her own role in perpetuating that hate. Pelosi should apologize, and not simply because it's good manners. Hate hoaxes make ethnic groups fear and distrust each other. That's a dangerous thing to do in a country that's becoming more diverse by the day. The only way to prevent future Tawana Brawleys and Jussie Smollett's is for the people who've promoted these lies to acknowledge what they've done, ask for forgiveness for doing it, and pledge to stop judging others on the basis of racial stereotypes. We need to resolve the Jussie Smollett story. We can't just move on to the next thing and act like it never happened, which is their plan. Smollett himself made that point, actually, at the end of his interview on Good Morning America. Watch. I still want to believe, with everything that has happened, that there's something called justice. We've got that in common. Something called justice. We all want to believe in that.